So let's begin with a, a discussion of the Neolithic Revolution. This is often called the Agricultural Revolution, which led to an urban revolution. So when you see the term Neolithic, sometimes we're talking about new stone, which is what Neolithic means in Greek. Sometimes we're talking about the Agricultural Revolution that was a time period when people went from a nomadic lifestyle to a settled lifestyle and began practicing agriculture. And also, this is going to lead to what we would call uh, city living. So the urban revolution is part of this as well. In your McClellan and Dorn, they'll talk a little bit about uh, the transition from Paleolithic, old stone, to Neolithic, new stone. So the Paleolithic era, a very long time period that in a class on history, we just don't have time to get into because this is truly prehistoric. This is a time period before there was historical record keeping, at least in the, the method that, that we think of historical record keeping. So two and a half million years, we think the Paleolithic era lasted, but it's only in the last 200,000 years or so that uh, people like us, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, actually um, existed are part of the the, the record, the, the uh, anthropological record, actually. And so uh, while this is a very long time period, two and a half million years, uh, folks who look like us, folks with, folks with our brain capacity, essentially, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, wise thinking humans, show up about 200,000 years ago. And this map is, uh, it's theoretical. Uh, Archaeology is constantly unearthing uh, new evidence to either support or refute some of these dates. But right now, our best evidence suggests that about 200,000 years ago, we have the earliest examples of Homo sapiens sapiens in Africa, about 70,000 years ago uh, in Western Asia. And if you follow the arrows here, right, where humans are supposed to have uh, migrated, moved, you get about 40,000 years ago into Europe. A little before that into Australia, some 50,000 years ago, we can find the earliest evidence. Moving into China and then across uh, the land bridge, if you will, between uh, around the Bering Strait, between Russia and Alaska, uh, we think around 20,000 years ago, humans were crossing over. This was an ice flow, an ice sheet at the time. And then the earliest examples we can find of Homo sapiens sapiens in this part of the world, in the Americas, is about 15,000 to 12,000 years ago. So what was life like for Paleolithic folks? And why talk about them in a history of science and society class? McClellan and Dorn are going to discuss Paleolithic peoples and Neolithic peoples and talk about whether or not they had a scientific mindset. Were they practicing science or were they practicing technology? And this is their discussion about which comes first. Is it science or technology? And for them, technology comes first, right? Um, and they particularly look to how uh, people lived in the day. How did they manage? They're getting by on hunting. They're getting by on gathering. We think the hunting primarily done by the men in the population because men could leave a group of uh, their community for days at a time. They would hunt in packs, if you will, uh, and they could bring back large animals, hopefully, uh, for, the, for the group, for the community to be able to enjoy that protein, right? Uh, sorry if you're a vegetarian, but hunting, a, a big part of this. Uh, gathering, the gathering aspect, we think primarily associated with the women uh, who uh, have to stay also together. Women will give birth to children. Women are going to be very vulnerable in that time period. And women are going to basically be living together while the men are off hunting, protecting each other to some extent, but gathering up roots, berries, uh, other fruits, vegetables perhaps, that, that are available. We think the lifespan in the Paleolithic era was uh, relatively short, around 35 years, give or take. They had minimal population growth. Life was hard. Life was dangerous. Childbirth, one of the most dangerous things that uh, a Paleolithic woman could ever do. And so uh, having those children survive childbirth, having the women survive, survive childbirth uh, was was not altogether as common as it is today. So um, very short life, life expectancy uh, just because of the nature of life and very limited population growth because a lot of uh, babies did not survive 
beyond infancy. Uh, the people tended to follow the herds of animals and they had very limited territorial expansion. So uh, following the seasons, following the animals for their food. One of the great differences or great achievements, if you will, um, that happens in human history, and this is really where McClellan and Dorn get going, and this is where our class begins, is the Neolithic era. And the Neolithic era, the New Stone Age, uh, is a time period when we start to get the development of agriculture. I should probably explain a little bit that Paleolithic, meaning Old Stone, relates to the kinds of tools that were used. In Paleolithic period, we think very simple tools, essentially rock, stone, yes? And what would happen is you would find rocks that could be sharpened, typically by knocking them against other rocks. So taking a rock, sharpening it against another stone to, to form sort of a, a sharpened stone, if you will. That's Paleolithic, that's old stone. Neolithic, we get more complex. We start to have um, composite tools, if you will, where you might take a, a wooden shaft and attach it to that sharpened axe head, and that way you get a little more leverage with your tool, a little more power with that tool. So there's not a huge amount of difference, if you will, between old stone and new stone that we might be able to see, but for these people, this was a huge change. So, uh, and anthropologists, archaeologists can really see a difference, if you will, between those kinds of um, capabilities. So the Neolithic era, the Neolithic era, new stone, also, as we said at the beginning, called the agricultural revolution or the urban revolution begins probably around 10,000 years ago, so around 8,000 BC, give or take. The dates are really soft. That's the end of the last ice age. Uh, that's when that land bridge, that, that ice flow here again between Alaska and Siberia melted, gave way, and so it wasn't quite so easy to uh, traverse anymore. But what we do start to see agricult uh, archaeologically, excuse me, is agricultural development. So these dark green areas here, uh, we're going to see uh, people settling down and developing agriculture at least uh, perhaps before 5000 BC here in the Nile River Valley, here in the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley, in India along the Indus River, in China along the Yellow and the Yangtze Rivers, also in uh, South America, here in what is ancient Peru, and in North America, here uh, what we might think of as the Mayan territory. So um, people start to settle down primarily around 10,000 BC, or maybe 8,000 BC, and where we see them settling primarily is along the great river valleys of the world. Also, interestingly, we have a fellow by the name of Jared Diamond who likes to look at this time period also along the same general latitude, right? And that, that's an interesting development as well because he suggests that the climate around these latitudes here um, allow for similar kinds of farming throughout the world and also the sharing of technology because they're on the same general latitude. Uh, certain agricultural technologies will work here and maybe not work so well up in North America. Again, we do have some exceptions, as you can see here in Indonesia and also in South America, that, that might dif differ from that, that theory about moving along the same latitude. In your McClellan and Dorn book, they divide that first chapter into several sections and one of them is noted as growing your own and uh, they're talking a little bit about this idea of uh, the fusion of technology right and they're suggesting that unlike Jared Diamond who likes to think of all of those cultures along that same latitude that there's enough physical separation between all the great early civilizations that they most likely developed independently on their own they certainly later on came to con contact one another, and we'll talk about that. They basically go, human beings basically go uh, from a hunter-gatherer society to a settled society. 
We think this has to do with uh, the end of the last ice age, around 10,000 BC or so. The planet itself warmed up a little bit, and more land, particularly in the northern hemisphere, became available for, for, for use. Right? Those, those glaciers receded. People moved from gathering of vegetables and fruits, nuts and berries, to gardening, figuring out how to plant uh, the grains they found, the seeds that they found that they would eat. And uh, they went from hunting to herding, hunting to domestication of animals. So gathering to gardening, hunting to herding. And this is a complex process. This doesn't just happen overnight, as you might imagine. And many argue that uh, it's a very difficult process because the first folks who wanted to settle down actually uh, had to expend more calories on a daily basis to get farming going than they had to to do hunting and gathering. So this idea of it being an easier kind of life, we think at the beginning not so much. Uh, still there was a great impetus among humans to want to settle down, to have a steady supply of water, a steady supply of food. So domestication of plants and animals, one of the first uh, scientific, if you will, technological innovations that happens is uh, domestication is a process that involves taming, breeding, genetic selection, and occasionally introducing plants into new ecological settings. So these are things that are deliberately done, maybe sometimes by accident, but uh, human beings actually getting into the process of understanding the natural world around them and trying to get nature to do what they want nature to do. When it comes to domesticating wheat, humans change the plant's genes. The plant then changed humanity. And this is a big theme you're going to see uh, throughout the history of science and technology in that human beings are able to somehow uh, cross strains, uh, interbreed animals, uh, different kinds of dogs perhaps, right? And try to create new sorts of of uh, plants and animals that help them in their domestication processes, that help them in their settling process. And then in return, that domesticating activity is going to change human beings too because we're going to change the way we live our daily lives because of this, right? So it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. Animals, selective slaughtering, selective breeding, uh, all of this goes together. There are going to be some things that... Um, humans uh, don't care to have around. Uh, in particular, you might think about wolves in North America that we have been in the past century sort of, uh, well, decimating that wolf population that we've been trying to get rid of that wolf population such that conservationists now think we need to reintroduce the wolf. Ranchers, farmers in the Great Plains, not real crazy about that idea. Uh, but the idea, but we, but we don't want to lose that that species if we can help it. So certain things we like. So we like cattle, goats, sheep, pigs, chickens. All of these are animals that are some, among the earliest domesticated on the planet. Once we start to settle down and we are farming, we are domesticating animals. We start to develop a surplus. It takes a long time, but we do finally develop a surplus. And one of the things that also follows this, this agricultural surplus is a tendency towards leisure. We have a little more time on our hands, and we're going to start to see new technology developing that reflects this. Uh, the first thing that McClellan and Dorn will talk to you about is textiles. Uh, we're going to have a need for clothing. And yes, indeed, we can use animal skins if we like, but... Uh, if, if we can grow that, that clothing, if we can use uh, vegetable fibers instead, then we might um, get a, a little more, uh, well, uh, a, a more bang for our buck out of our agricultural processes, right? Uh, and McClellan and Dorn are going to talk a little bit about all the different kinds of technology that relate to making cloth. So they'll talk about shearing sheep. They'll talk about harvesting flax or cotton. Uh, they'll talk about uh, processing these materials uh, in such a way that you can spin thread. And then you're going to develop looms. And looms are a technology for weaving, 
right? And then after that, maybe you'll want to dye this cloth into particular patterns or, or to reflect particular colors that are important to you for some reason. And then, of course, there's the artistic side of it, that the designs that you're putting onto these textiles have some kind of symbols associated with them that, that maybe are important to you, maybe uh, for your family, for the region, maybe somehow for your religious purposes. So lots of different technologies start to develop because we've settled down. Oh, this is an example of a Neolithic textile from Egypt. Again, it's extraordinary that this, this is flax. This is flax. Uh, flax is a plant that grows along the Egyptian Nile. And you can uh, use the fibers from this plant to, again, create thread, go through the weaving process, etc. I'm always impressed when cloth that's 5,000 years old manages to survive to today. The Egyptian climate is very good for that because many areas along the Nile are very dry. And as you probably know, moisture creates bacteria. Bacteria can uh, then allow uh, decay. So again, a Neolithic textile from Egypt. Other technologies, and McClellan and Dorn will talk about the importance of pottery. Uh, pottery is a great thing because it can you can use it as a storage vessel for uh, your surplus food, your surplus grain. Uh, one of the uh, earliest things that, that folks make from this surplus grain are uh, potent potables, we might call them. Beer, uh, wine start to be produced, and those things can have a long shelf life, and you want to be able to store them in a way that allows those to continue to be um, tasty to drink and also beneficial for cooking and, and other things. Um, the other thing that McClellan Dorn note is that with pottery, there is this business of firing pottery. If you can fire it, if you can glaze it, most of the early stuff is not glazed, but if you can fire it, you can dry the water from the mortar, right, to make uh, clay mortar into stone. And that's not only just for pottery, but maybe for brick making as well. The kilns from the earliest kilns we have seen evidence of uh, are operating at some 900 degrees centigrade. And that's impressive. So that's quite hot. And so is this science or is this technology? It's pyrotechnology, right? Uh, do folks understand uh, the science behind it? Perhaps not, but there is a lot of trial and error associated with using heat to try to create these, uh, these, these crafts, if you will, create this uh, pottery, uh, bricks, etc. Uh, the same kind of uh, use of heat, control of heat, will support metallurgy and bronze working, right? So uh, Neolithic era, often called the Bronze Age as well. Oh, this is just one example of a Neolithic pot. So not only do you get a shape that is uh, utilitarian, it's functional, you don't get to see the lid here, sorry, the lip here, but you also can get this nice little design here that someone took the time to also try to develop an aesthetic association with this pot. So what are some of the social effects of settling down? This is a class called Science and Society, so it's not just uh, thinking about uh, history of science, but it's also thinking about how science and technology have come to shape who we are. We said in the Neolithic era that we're going to engage in um, uh, domestication of plants. That's a certain sort of uh, genetically modified organisms going on, right, in a very rudimentary fashion. So we're going to do some domestication of plants, but in the process, that's going to change who we are, how we live how uh, it's going to change our life expectancy, which is extraordinary. It's going to grow our population because now we have a food surplus and it's, it's, it's easier to feed our, our children. It's easier to feed ourselves, our animals. So we're going to see lots of uh, population growth. Uh, the other thing we're going to see is this idea of um, gender roles changing. We think that in the Paleolithic period that both men and women had equal responsibility for maintaining the success of the, the group, the success of the community. And so some suggest that perhaps there was, at that point, a, a very equal distribution of authority, responsibility in, in those societies. When we settle down, it seems that men typically engage in what we might call the outdoor tasks. 
that's you know heavy farming farming where you can get away from the house plow in the back 40 my uncle used to say right so getting away from the house uh, getting up with the sun having something to eat going out and working in the fields and then coming back home at the end of the day as the sun comes down that's because the men can do that right the women have to stay closer to the house the this permanent dwelling perhaps that we've made out of our mud brick that we've fired in our kilns and they have to stay closer to home because that's where the children are and so women have to feed those children and uh, because at this point we're using breastfeeding right we're not women can't be far from children especially in the early stages of their development so we think that probably the women stay home now it's probably more than one woman in the household it's probably multi-generations and probably you don't live too far from another family it's it's far enough that you could probably go the whole day without seeing them at any rate we think that uh, women are doing the indoor tasks and what that all includes is not only of course the the crafts of pottery making perhaps at home the crafts of beer making at home we know for sure women are doing that we have examples but also maybe a small kitchen garden but certainly not going too far away from the house in order to hear that child who might go into distress right so uh, we think that that's happening now why why do we say there's there's gender roles here that are taking place well we think that um, when it came time to making wide community decisions it's the men who are working hard again working in groups working out there in the field taking a break and then discussing what's going on we think that these men are working together in common on irrigation on farming etc and that they are the ones who then get together to try to decide you know maybe we need some rules about our irrigation system maybe we need some rules about when we start uh, harvesting etc and so it seems that the men are making the public decisions a lot of people suggest and the women are making the the closer to home decisions and in this regard it seems that when it comes to public life if you will men kind of move to the fore and take on a larger role in society other elements uh, defense if you will uh, men are going to be engaged in defense as well that, that, that when a, 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 an emergency comes along and we need to gather all our resources to defend ourselves perhaps from some raiding group etc the men are out there in the fields and they understand what's going on and they get together and they go so we have examples uh, on the next slide of uh, one of the earliest Neolithic cities and this is Jericho Jericho of biblical fame and it has towers it has walls and they seem to be very much concerned very much prepared for raiding this is an aerial view of the ancient site of Jericho you might remember it from biblical uh, stories of Joshua and taking on Jericho and having the walls come down and so this great citadel that you see here you can you can sort of see the rock outcroppings you can sort of see uh, ancient wall remains here and then also here and so this is uh, what's left of if you will that ancient city and here's an artist drawing of what they think this city might have looked at this is a little more medieval Jericho uh, this is definitely a medieval rendition of walls here but still the idea of the city everyone's sort of living inside the walls worried about defense and then out here you get both uh, this is more of a moat here sorry you don't get as much as I'd like to see but here are the fields here's where we're gonna work out in the fields way beyond all of this again this is more of a medieval this would be about oh, 1200 AD this is more of a medieval rendition but still the same idea of uh, a walled city in antiquity perhaps people living in the cities here inside the walls to protect themselves from anything that might come along and then the men, the, so the women and families working inside, the men out here working in the fields.